Hi, I'm Josh McDonald. And I'm Randa Materi, and we are Hand Therapy Academy. Let's talk about neuromas, all things neuroma related. Um, first, let's talk about what is a neuroma and what does it do to our, like how do our patients experience those? So Miranda, you want to give us a little functional description? Yeah. Of so I feel like I just recently, I've had a few neuromas and they're all um, like finger amputation, transmetacarpal amputation. Um, so that's where I've been seeing a few of them. And I've had lots of, for some reason, I've had lots of therapists ask me questions about neuromas. So I thought it'd be a helpful topic, but basically in the cases that I'm currently seeing in my clinic, it's where the nerve has been transected and um, the nerve basically just grows like a ball at the end. So that tissue just balls up and reforms a neuroma. So ulma means mass or ball and then neur is the nerve, right? So a mass or ball of the nerve that has formed. And typically they're very, very sensitive. So even if you're going in there and desensitizing it, a lot of times it won't desensitize. Um, and typically these patients have to go in and have some type of procedure done. And with neuromas or with the nerves, when they're cut and they're no longer innervating a structure that they're supposed to innervate, the nerve always wants to have a job to do. So when it loses its job, so that being sensing or using a, a motor point that it's um, innervating, then it starts to act up. So a lot of some of the newer stuff is doing some surgeries to give the nerve a job to do again, or um, they're still like, of course, burying them. Like I've seen them drill holes and burying them in the metacarpal and those things. Is that um, kind of your experience with neuromas or what are you Yeah, saying? yeah, definitely. Um, and I feel like it's, it's those traumatic amputations. I haven't seen as many with like a flexor tendon injury where the nerve is still lacerated. I feel like it's the higher trauma patients that are more likely to get them. Um, I think I've seen some in lesser traumas, but I feel like it's much more common in the the bigger amputations. And I think it's just a nervous system gone haywire. And that attempt to grow turns into this ball on the end of the nerve. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think like, you know, when you're talking about like flexor tendons and stuff and like, say it's a zone two, the surgeon always goes in and, you know, puts the nerve back together and whether that nerve heals and recovers, I think, um, you know, it, it oftentimes doesn't, but at least the nerve is like getting the signal and, you know, there's some activity mm -hmm. going on. So it's not like stuck without a job to do. Yeah. And I think that's my theory on why we don't see um, as many of those types of injuries versus the ones where they the fingers are gone, you know, the, some of the muscle structures are gone. Now, what, what does that nerve do? It yeah. doesn't really serve a purpose anymore. So its purpose is to get irritated and grow. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And it wants to find that purpose. It's yeah. And I've had some patients, uh, in the past where the neuroma was like deep in the thenar eminence, uh, or in like maybe P1 of the thumb. And I feel like that is such a high traffic area for use of the hand that I don't know. I, I'm wondering too, if that like aggravated maybe what was a small yeah. neuroma into a much more uh, prominent sensation problem. Like it can be agitated into a bigger growth and become like this bigger thing. Right. And then these patients are getting, you know, uh, at least at my one clinic, we see a lot of amputees that are work comp related. And so they're getting these great prosthetics, you know, but they oftentimes won't be able to wear them, right? So if we don't identify the neuroma early and take care of it, then they might have a $100,000 prosthetic that they can't even wear because of this, you know, pesky neuroma that we're having struggling with. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So, and so, oh, I'm so sorry. that's okay. There's a lot of patients I feel like that we, talk about not ignoring pain, but working through pain and like, oh, that's, that's uncomfortable. I'm sorry. We'll try to desensitize and, and work through range of motion. But there comes a time when you realize, hey, this is maybe much more focal of a pain point and it's not getting better. And the response to that one pain, not like CRPS where the whole global system is turned up in intensity, but that one area, when you start to identify that, hey, that specific spot is lit up. And if I go a centimeter any direction away from it, it's really much less sensitive. That tells me I shouldn't just try to plow through it, that maybe I need to send them back to the doctor or at their follow-up visit, maybe say, hey, maybe we need to look at this neuroma and talk to the patient about like, really communicate to them like, that laser point spot right there is the culprit. 
Yeah. And then when they do have those neuromas and then we fire that pain response and then we keep firing it and firing it and firing it, right? Like if they're trying to wear a third prosthetic and it's not desensitizing or not getting better, then you're basically just reinforcing that pain pathway, right? And then once they do, so then even when they go to have the neuroma removed, they still have that pain pathway, even though the neuroma is gone, right? The initial etiology of the pain is gone, but that pathway is still very much active. So I think with these neuroma patients, if you keep firing the pain signal and you don't take care of it early, it creates like this feedback thing where you're like just chasing your tail, trying to get rid of it. Yeah. I've seen them go in and like bury them in the metacarpal and you're thinking like, how does this neuroma ever grow back or how do they still have this pain response? And I think it's very much that pain pathway. Yeah. Yeah. And at that point, it doesn't take much to trigger that response. And then that, that upper cortex version of pain perception kicks in and it's like, oh, my brain remembers that. It's got to be that significant, even if it's just the smallest, slightest stimulus. Yeah. So then I've seen where like instead of the surgeon trying to bury it deeper into the soft tissue or into the bone, I've seen where they're now like trying to find motor points, you know, like they use a little e-stem unit on, and I don't think it's an e-stem unit. I don't know what it's called, but they use this little unit to stimulate the motor point when they're in surgery. And then they basically take that nerve um, that's causing the problem and co-opt it into um that muscle point and then the nerve essentially has a new job to do so you're not getting that negative pain pathway interesting okay all right yeah so i think there's like other options and things that are doing um honestly i haven't seen it in my clinical practice though yeah yeah but always new things to learn and and get exposed to because that's the kind of thing that you know if if you tell a patient like hey maybe ask your doctor if this is something that could you that could be pursued or if they're kind of kicking back on surgery after surgery on it yeah. yeah, there might be some other options out there. And when I saw that talk, it was a few years ago. So I'm sure there's even more stuff that's um, come out now. I think it's just finding like the clinics and the surgeons that are doing them. Yeah, yeah. It's an interesting thing to, to pain is such an interesting concept because we deal with patients who have pain that is hard to define and patients with pain that we understand. And there's patients like this that have pain that is so specific and so focal and there's really nothing we can do except help them navigate to go get it addressed surgically or with padding or but like i can't make that better for you but i can help you manage the symptoms and and cope with it until we can get it addressed yeah and i think identify like as therapists we're with these patients you know sometimes two, three hours, right? A a week. So we're the one that has the most contact. And I think sometimes we, you know, we may pick it up just because by default, we're with this patient so much so we can be the communicator with the surgeon. So sometimes I'll even go with my patients to their doctor's appointment, like, hey, what do you think about this? Do you think it's a neuroma? Is there anything different we should be doing in therapy? And I honestly learn a lot from the surgeon. And I also think sometimes they're like, oh, maybe, you know, maybe you're right. Let's take a closer look at it. Yeah. And I'm always surprised when you coach a patient and say, all right, you want to ask them about this and this and this. And they get back and like, yeah, I forgot all this stuff. Well, did you mention the pain in your hand? No, I forgot about that. I'm like, oh my gosh, that's the most, <laughs> Im- that's the most impactful thing in your life right now. How did you forget that one? So sometimes we need to, you know, whether it's a text to the doctor before their session or you go to their session or whatever it is, kind of helping that. Note. Yeah. Helping sometimes that patient. Get the notes though. Yeah. <laughs> Yes. Yes. Had that happen today. Patient forgot to take my note to the doctor's office. <laughs> yeah. It happens all the time. I'm always like, you know what? I'm just going to, if it's really, I think it's really crucial. I'm going to just try to find a way to get there. <laughs> yeah. 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 Definitely. Uh, yeah. So more interesting stuff on neuromas. If you guys have thoughts or questions, uh, certainly reach out to us through our email info at Hand Therapy Academy or on any of our social media platforms uh, at Hand Therapy Academy.